Today's um, sharing is indeed uh, one which is very relevant uh, and useful to reflect upon on Buddha Day. In fact, this was the same theme we used uh, last uh, Vesak or last uh, Buddha Day yeah, for the year 2021. But it is also still very useful and very relevant because one year later, having seen what has happened to the country, to the world, to the community, yeah, to us, we have new understandings of how to live and how to deal with such a threat. Uh, believe me, the coronavirus, this COVID-19, is a threat. Yeah, and it is still a threat. But we are now able to deal with it in a more effective and comprehensive way. Yeah, we know what to do. We are not so fearful as when it, were, it first started. So it is worth now, I think, to take stock, meaning to say, to take a look at where we are now. Yeah, and where we are now in this hall on Buddha Day yeah, is a very good indication yeah, of how we are becoming more, um, we know how to overcome difficulties yeah, and challenges yeah, in our lives. Certainly, collectively, yeah, as a group, as a community, we are now able to come together yeah, to celebrate, yeah, to enjoy each other's company, yeah, to uh, build our organization yeah, for the future. So I prepared this uh, sharing of slides. So let me start with the first slide I have. So again, I wish you happy Buddha Day. And together with this slide, I have put the statement, because there is suffering, Buddhas attain enlightenment. So this is something which we have been going through. Yeah, we have been actually yeah, uh, at a higher level of suffering. Because when, it, when the pandemic first started, we didn't have much knowledge. The scientists, the doctors, uh, those who are dealing with these kinds of uh, diseases and problems, they didn't have much knowledge. Yeah, but as we were able to ride through, to go through this period, now we know what to do. So it is a form of suffering. But as mentioned by Sister Budini, it is certainly not the first. And it certainly yeah, will not be the last. There will be other challenges. Because as we grow as a global population, the population of this world is growing very, very fast. But of course, we lost some along the way due to this pandemic. But when things settle down again, the population, the people of this world, yeah, the population is going to grow. And therefore, we are going to have more challenges. Yeah, as we grow, there will be more challenges, not just in the form of disease, but also other uh, societal, communal, yeah, interpersonal uh, challenges. It's going to hit us. But I would like to say today, from where I am sitting, and I take a look at the hall, it is a beautiful sight. <laughs> it's so wonderful, so joyous to see everyone, so many of you gathered here uh, today that for a two-year period, 
I was wondering whether it would ever take place again. Yeah, because if this COVID-19 virus is not controllable, we cannot come together like this. But today, it's a wonderful sight. Yeah, it really makes me joyous. Yeah, and also, I would like to acknowledge the participation of our Nalandians yeah, from different parts of the country yeah, who have come on uh, to join us online. So let us take a look at this statement. Because there is suffering, Buddhas attain enlightenment. If there is no suffering, my dear brothers and sisters, we will not need Buddhas. Have we ever thought of that state, of that fact? If there is no suffering, why do we have Buddhas? But because there are Buddhas, uh, there is suffering. Because there is pain, because there is sorrow and sadness, the Buddhas appear. Human beings, beings work very, very hard, put in superhuman effort to overcome the deficiencies of existence, of the mind, in order to attain Buddhahood. And this is what we are celebrating. This is what we are rejoicing today. We are re rejoicing this ability of beings, usually human beings, to be able to attain the supreme enlightenment. And uh, this is due to the fact that when Buddhas appear, they teach us, they reveal to us, they show us the way to overcome this suffering so that we can understand it, so that we are not fearful of it. Yeah, as Sister Budini said, the, 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 the fear doesn't arise as it used to. Because when we don't understand, when we don't have understanding of what this suffering is, we will be incredibly afraid. In fact, let me tell you this, uh, my dear Dhamma brothers and sisters. In December of last year, I caught COVID. And it was quite an interesting series of events. On Friday, I did not feel very well. So I took the, um, the, the self-test and it was negative. And because it was negative, I went to join a Nalanda activity in Wisdom Park. So Saturday, Sunday, I was with Nalandians in Wisdom Park. And then I came back and on Monday, I took another test and it was positive. So there is an, an, an element of unpredictability. Sometimes we think we are okay, but we are not okay. But the thing that appeared in my mind when I had this confirmation of, positive, yeah, of a positive result was, am I going to live through it? The fear arose. Yeah, what happens if I'm one of those, the small number that's going to die? <laughs> that thought ran through my mind. In fact, my wife also caught it. Yeah. And together, we suffered. No, two, the two of us suffered together. But when I reflected on the fact that I had had the vaccinations, when I understood what needed to be done to keep myself strong, then the, the, the mind started to change. The fear abated, the fear went down. But that didn't mean that I was 100% confident I would get through it because it was the old strain. I think in December of last year, the Delta strain yeah, was the most prevalent. But as it went through day after day, with the support of good friends, 
yeah, who came and delivered. We couldn't get, go out the gate yeah, to buy things, but friends and relatives gathered to support us. Yeah, it made us feel very, very appreciated. And we went through this problem yeah, together. Yeah, with, with this fact, uh, with, with the um, recovery yeah, that uh, we actually enjoyed. So, when we are not sure of anything, when we do not know what is ahead of us, it's quite common to be fearful, to be afraid, not to have courage. And when we don't have that, yeah, we go through a lot of suffering. So the Buddhas understood this. The last Buddha to appear yeah, on this world was, was Gautama the Buddha, who appeared, who attained enlightenment 2,600 over years, over years ago. So he brought us this message that we have to understand the nature of our suffering. We have to understand how unpredictable our lives are, how the, the circumstances of our lives keep on changing. We cannot be sure. We want to be sure, but we cannot be sure. How sure are we? How sure am I? that I will still be alive tomorrow. We have no security. But we learn to live with it. Yeah, we learn how to cope. And for this, we are gathered here today to commemorate, to remember and to reflect on these teachings that the Buddhas came, appeared, gained the enlightenment so that they could share with us. And the remarkable thing is, when we understand suffering, we become happy. Because it is not mysterious. Suffer suffering doesn't stay a mystery. You know, great big question mark. Why are we here? Why am I in pain? Why am I having such hard times? We understand it. And because of that, we develop courage. The knowledge gives us hope. Because the Buddha said, you are not, we are not doomed to suffer forever. We are not doomed. Yeah, we are not, you know, put into a place where we are suffering, suffering, and there is no end to that suffering. The Buddha said, because I have understood because of the enlightenment, because of what I have seen, I share and therefore we have the courage and hope to face these challenges, yeah? these ups and downs of our lives. Sometimes we are up, sometimes we are down. But we face these ups and downs with knowledge, with understanding, with wisdom. And therefore, we keep ourselves secure with this understanding. So that's why Buddha Day is so important. It is an acknowledgement. It is a statement that we place in our hearts that there will always be suffering, but we can meet it with courage, a kind of a fearlessness, which I will talk about afterwards, as well as hope. You know, we never give up hope. We don't give up hope. We can always improve and do better. So, why we need courage and hope? You know, as I've explained, it's to uh, keep us afloat. It is to keep us buoyant. We stay above all the sorrow and the lamentation because we can see it in the world. People who do not understand the nature of the world, they become very depressed. They become very sad. They start crying. They beat their chest. They pull their hair. 
you know, they lose absolute control of their lives. But when we understand, when we have courage and hope, yeah, we still walk the straight path. We still walk this noble eightfold path yeah, that gives us so much joy, so much courage, yeah, and so much hope. So let's look at these two qualities more in detail. Yeah. What do we mean when we talk about courage? In Pali, the normal term used for the word courage is usahita. So it means to make people more bold, more brave, more courageous. You, know, you, you are no longer afraid. You know, when I was young, I was full of fear because the way I was brought up was yeah, that my relatives and people who looked after me made me scared of the dark. Yeah, just like in most Chinese families, in order to control kids, you make them afraid. You know, in the dark, uh, something will come and catch hold of you. So you better behave yourself, right? And there was a time when I was um, given, I think, by my grandmother, a Buddha image yes, to, to wear, uh, so that I would not be so fearful, so afraid to go to the toilet. But then I realized, because some, someone told me, you cannot wear Buddha image into the toilet. Because Buddha image is something that you pay respect to. So I kept taking off the Buddha image to go into the toilet. Yeah, and that was something which was uh, quite, you know, uh, it was quite tedious. You know, it was not convenient. And then I began to think for myself. Yeah, at that age, I began to think, did the Bu Buddha go to the toilet or not? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> The Buddha is, was, uh, had, the, had the body, he needed to go to the toilet. Yeah? So in, I, I stopped taking off the uh, Buddha image in order to go to the toilet. What I'm trying to say is, when we do not understand what is the actual situation, we think and we behave yeah, in a very illogical way. So when I was young, I was full of illogic, <laughs> of all this nonsense that people told me yeah, about ghosts, about uh, demons, yeah, about the dark, so much so that from the downstairs, I did not dare to go upstairs when there was no one else. So I was so full yeah, of this fear. But when I came across the Buddha's teachings, yeah, I began to understand. So it doesn't mean that I will, um, without hesitation, tonight go and spend the night in a cemetery. It, it doesn't mean that. But it meant that now I can go to places that are dark and not be afraid. Because I can understand what are ghosts, what are spirits, you know, what it means to be in a lonely place. So that gave me courage to understand yeah, my Sunday school, my Dhamma school teachers, they taught me to understand and not be so full of fear. So it's a very important learning that we need. So therefore, in our lives now, as adults, we still are gripped by many forms of fear. Many things make us afraid. Many things we want to avoid because we don't understand it. And some people say, don't mix with this group of people because they are different from us. That is indeed trying to instill fear where we don't need this kind of fear. We don't, we don't need it. So, we open our minds. The Buddha's teachings is meant to open our minds so that we can get rid of nonsense, superstition, wrong beliefs, wrong ideas, wrong understanding. More important, wrong views. 
Mitcha Ditti, wrong views. And then what will appear will be a kind of a boldness, courage, fearlessness. So here, yeah. it, this word in Pali means to make people more bold. We try to make our children more bold. Don't be afraid. Let's go. Yeah? Let's go to this place. Yeah? Let's do these things. Don't be afraid about you know, the uh, environment that we might not understand. To motivate a person to face fear, which arises. Why does fear arise? Fear arises be because we think. If we do this, in the near future, we are going to suffer. Again, it is another view of suffering. I am afraid because if I do it, if I do it, I will suffer after that. That's why we are afraid. We don't like suffering. So we think, if I do these things, I will suffer. So the way out of this is to understand the nature of our fear. Understand it. What exactly yeah, is this fear? And when we can understand what it is, we deal with it. It doesn't mean that the fear will disappear. What it means is we deal with it. We know how to manage it. Because all these things, the mental states that appear in, in us, the Buddha said, yeah, let us learn how to deal with it. They will forever be there. There will always be some kind of anger in us. There will always be some kind of jealousy in us. There will be a hatred. There will be a disliking for certain people. It comes with our human nature. So what do we do? We develop the understanding to deal with this unpleasant, unwholesome tendencies inside us. Yeah, so this is an important uh, fact. In hard times, Buddhists will call upon this fearlessness, abhaya. In Malay, there is this word bahaya. You understand what it is? Yeah. It is from the ancient Indian uh, uh, Pali Sanskrit. Uh, word. So the word is bhaya. Yeah. The fearlessness is abhaya. And this is why I have included this image of the Buddha. This image, it doesn't mean to say hello. Yeah. It means to say be without fear. Because Buddhas appear be without fear. Fear. It is the Abhaya Mudra. And so, when we put up Buddha images, and this is the posture, we take it to mean the Buddha tells us don't be afraid of suffering because I am going to teach you to have hope to overcome this suffering. So that is the nature of this. The, this is the significance of the Abhaya Mudra. Sometimes the Buddha will be standing and they will place it outside. And sometimes the Buddha will be in a sitting, pos uh, sitting posture. But still, yeah, when he puts his hand like this, it means don't be afraid. Have fearlessness. Abhaya. Fearlessness is an aspect of virya. We know, you know, we have come across this word virya. Virya means energy. And virya is an important uh, part of the Noble Eightfold Path. Because in order to progress, in order to develop ourselves, we need the energy you know, of that is described as virya. So it is mental as well as physical energy. We go forward. We never go backwards. We use the energy to drive ourselves further and further and further forward. 
In this word viria, this energy, this wonderful aspect, there is related the word vira. In Malay, it's vira. What does it mean? Hero, yes. This heroic courage, the heroic effort is part of viria. It's got the same root, viria, vira. It means that when you have this energy, when you understand the Buddha's teachings, yeah, when you appreciate why the Buddhas appear from time to time, of course, the, um, the, the, the span, the duration from one Buddha appearing and another Buddha appearing, it's very, very long time. Yeah, it's not that Buddhas keep on appearing because some people say, oh, they are, this person must be a Buddha because he's very wise. That person is so clever and intelligent. I think he is a Buddha. So they are living Buddhas. Yeah, no need to pay respect to the dead Buddhas. But th that is not a true statement because the Buddhas do not appear often. Yeah, it takes a long, long, long time before one Buddha appears yeah, um, after another one. I, I discovered this. Let me very quickly share it with you. Yeah. There are some sayings remaining from the Buddha before Gautama. So there is, uh, there, in fact, in this world cycle, there is Kakusanda, Konagama. Uh, Kakusanda, Konagama. Who's the number three? Uh, huh? Kasyapa Buddha. Yeah. And then Gautama. And there will be one more called Maitreya. It was written that Kasyapa Buddha, the Buddha before Gautama, he appeared in this land called Jambudipa. Yeah, it is a land yeah, which they describe as an island of the Jambu. It's a kind of a tree. I'm not sure whether it is the same Jambu as in Malaysia. But it is the land of this Jambu tree, which was an island. So the last Buddha, Kasyapa, appeared on an island. And then I thought, this cannot be. Because most the Buddhas are supposed to appear more or less in the same place. So this Jambu Dipper, this land of the Jambu, it cannot be an island. Because India yeah, is always joined to the continent of Asia. And then I did some research. It's true, India was once an island. Millions and millions of years ago, Jambu Dipa was an island separated from the Asian continent. And then it drifted. What is the speed of the drift, the movement? 4 cm every year. And it was so far away, but eventually it drifted and it hit the Asian continent. That time to move 4 cm per year took millions and millions. In fact, it could be billions of years. So that showed that the appearance of one Buddha to another takes billions, in fact, of years. Not easy to come by. Not easy to encounter the teachings of a Buddha. Not easy. So we must consider ourselves immensely fortunate to know a Buddha and to know the teachings because eventually these teachings will become lost, will become simplified and it will become lost. Just like the teachings of Kakusanda, Konagama, Kasyapa you know, have been lost, have gone disappeared from this earth. So therefore, this significance of the word vira, 
means never give up. A hero or a heroine never gives up. So when we are faced with the problems of the pandemic, of the changes to our lifestyles, to our uh, livelihood as well, we should build up the spirit, the thinking, the mindset of a hero with the virya. Never give up. And when one has virya as well as sadda, which is faith, he pushes on ahead. Never give up. There are people in this world who never give up. Even though they are faced with great challenges, they never give up. And we know some of these beings. Yeah, there are leaders in history whom, although they are facing great difficulties, unsurmountable yeah, challenges, they never give up. The word giving up it was not in their vocabulary. So, when we have fear, some people say it's good to fear because when we have fear, we keep away from danger. You know, something is happening over there. I am afraid. I don't want to go there. But is that the best way to understand life? Because life will always have dangers. You cannot be free from danger in life. We have to understand that. So, it's good to acknowledge fear. We must say, yes, I am afraid. I have fear in me. Now, I must take steps to understand it. So, we manage our fear through understanding as well as training. We understand it. And then we make the effort to look deeper into this fear. What exactly is this thing that is inside my heart that's making me shake and tremble and don't want to do anything? Because that's what happened to many people during the pandemic. They were so full of fear, just as I was in the first few days wondering whether I would make it or not. Then we understand. We understand that fear is a state of the mind. Just as anger is a state of the mind. Just as happiness also is a state of the mind. It comes and it goes. So with training, we learn to recognize it. So right now, we are very comfortable in this hall. When we go out, because it is so hot, we become uncomfortable. So our comfort, ex comfort, the experience of comfort, becomes an experience of discomfort. And when we go home, we are comfortable again. You see the changes? We are never comfortable all the time. Neither are we uncomfortable all the time. It's a changing experience of our lives that we must now come to understand. In my mind, there is fear. Then when the things change, ah, there is no more fear in my mind. Yeah. So we understand when a state of the mind is there. We also understand when a state of the mind is not there. Uh, are you feeling angry right now? Are you feeling sad? I hope not. You acknowledge it. There is no sadness in my mind now. There is no anger in my mind now. We acknowledge it. We see it and we acknowledge it. And so, when anger and sadness appears, then we know, ha, huh, anger and sadness are now appearing in my mind. We get used to the coming and going of these mental states. So, the Buddha, actually the Bodhisattva, was full of courage. You can imagine, if you can imagine, 
there was this young man who was always surrounded by love, who was always surrounded by comfort. His father built three palaces for him. He could enjoy whatever he wanted to enjoy. Imagine this young man staying in the jungle. What was his experience? He was always guarded by soldiers and friends. Then he decided to leave it all behind. The love, the security, and he went to stay in the forest and the jungle, which even right now in India are full of wild animals. There was a report I read some time back in Sri Lanka. This Buddhist monk went to a lake and a panther attacked him and killed him at the lake. Yeah, he wanted to, I think he was wandering and he wanted to wash himself. Unfortunately, he washed himself in the place where this black panther used to go. And so the animal didn't like it, attacked him and killed him. Today, today, <laughs> right? You know, it's not like, you know, hundreds of years ago. It still happens. So during the Buddha's time, he went out into this environment from a secure and comfortable environment where he had good food, good clothes, yeah, nice bed, into sleeping under trees in the dark. So he said, you know, when he first started living in the open air, he was full of fear. Could it be the tiger was coming? Yeah. Could it be snakes were coming? He was so full of fear. But his motto was, Mernivata, never go backwards. He was not going to go back to the palace. No matter what, he was not going to go back to his home. How uncomfortable, how dangerous he was not. He made that decision, I am not going back. So he didn't go back. And he braved the jungles and the forests for six long years until he attained the enlightenment. Other heroes was like our venerable Swen Sang, who travelled across scorching desert who travelled across forests full of bandits where people wanted to chop him, kill him and steal his things. And yet he did it. You know, he lived a life, actually, yeah, he, he, lived, he was living a comfortable life as well. Then he decided to make the journey to the West and he subjected himself to all kinds of dangers. But his motto was also the same, Never go backwards. Always forward. So, knowing fear is the beginning of fearlessness. When we understand the nature of fear, we develop a buyer, fearlessness, to go forward. So, have the hope that it can be trained. That's why I put there training. You can train yourself to be fearless, to have a buyer in your heart. Yeah. Not to give up, never to go backwards, always to go forward. Now I share with you the words of a man I really admire, but he has passed away. Yeah. His name, Nelson Mandela, the late president of the Republic of South Africa. He said, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear. To have courage means there is no fear. He learned it is not true. Fear is always going to be there. We acknowledge it. But how you triumph over it is actually the true meaning yeah, of courage. So we learn from these brave and wise people. 
how to advance ourselves. So, now in this situation, yeah, it is a time of coming back, of revival. And although we know that we want to gather again, there are steps, there are precautions, there is the SOP yeah, that we need to follow. Let us now look at hope. You know, during a period in history in, in the world, there were people who were afraid of doing things, doing the wrong thing, that would make them go down to hell. This was the, a religious belief. Yeah. The religious belief was, if you don't do what I tell you, you will go to hell. So those people who had no understanding, no knowledge, no intelligence, they believed it. So the religion was used to control people. Then they began to be educated. When they began to be educated, they didn't believe this anymore. So, yeah, for the Buddhists, we look at suffering and we know that there is always hope to overcome suffering. Why? Because the, Buddh the Buddhas have done it. So that is why on Buddha Day, we come and listen to promote our hope, develop more hope that we can overcome suffering. So this is what the Buddha taught us. There is a sure and a reliable way to overcome suffering. To overcome this body that is subject to disease. To overcome old age. To overcome unhappiness. Yeah, this is what the Buddha taught us. So, do we want to learn from the Buddha? Yes, that's why we are here. Although we are still wearing masks, <laughs> although we are spraying ourselves with that antivirus thing, we take the opportunity to come together again. And we are happy to mix with each other so that we can learn you know, the Buddha's message. Built on sadda or faith, we need to have this sadda, this faith. One knows that true freedom and happiness is ours if we only walk the path. Sometimes we complain, why is there so much difficulty? Why, is, why are people subject to so much suffering? You know, like in certain parts of the world, why are people bombing each other so efficiently? Yeah, you know there are now bombs and missiles that you cannot see. The minute you see it, it's already too late. You cannot run and hide from those missiles. They are so clever to develop such weapons. But they still do not know how to overcome their suffering. Yeah, they suffer. Because they cannot get their own way, they suffer. And because they suffer, they get angry. And because they get angry they start to fight each other. And then what happens? More suffering appears in the world. There is no understanding. There is no wisdom. So the Buddha explained that suffering is not never-ending. There is great hope in the Buddha's teachings because the Buddha explained that there is no one person that is totally evil. Because some you know, some faiths, they say, there is a being that is 100% evil. You cannot save this person. The Buddha said, no, everybody can practice the Dhamma. No matter how bad, no matter how evil, this person yeah, can turn around and experience Nibbana. Then the Buddha said, there is no person that is totally evil, but there is a person that is totally good. Oh, what hope. <laughs> Such great hope. There is no person that is totally evil, bad, yeah, and unwholesome. But there is a person that is totally wholesome. Who is this person? 
the Arahant. There are beings in this world that totally do not have greed, do not have anger, hatred, do not have delusion. And because of that, we have hope. Because we also hope to join the ranks of the Arahan. People, beings with no greed, no anger, no delusion. That hope is always with us. And now I share with you the, the words of another really wise teacher who has passed on. Venerable Thich Nhat Han, who passed away a few months ago. He said, hope is important because it can make the present moment less difficult to bear. Yeah? And it is due to, if we believe that tomorrow will be better, today is a hard day, but tomorrow will be better, we can bear a hardship today. So if you think, if you have the optimism to think, the good times are coming it will change. It will not always be so bad. It will not always be suffering. We hope and we carry ourselves through the difficult times. If you have no hope, then finish. Yeah. <laughs> if you have no hope, you will end your journey. It was told to us that Last year, I think it was last year, an average of four persons take their lives every week during the height of the pandemic. Meaning to say, every week there are about four people who kill themselves, commit suicide. Why? Why? Because they saw no hope. They have no hope. They don't think of a better tomorrow. It's going to get better. They cannot imagine things getting better. So today, I end it all. That is not a wise way of thinking. So if we have hope, as the Buddha promised to us, taught us, then we can go through yeah, a lot of hard times. So there is hope based on craving and there is the steadying energy of also being without expectations. We can hope for something like, I hope I will get first prize in the social welfare <laughs> lottery. You can also hope for that. But there is also hope of having good things without expectations. I will accept it. I will accept the hardship, but I know that things will get better. But whenever it gets better, I will accept it. I will not say, tomorrow must get better, you know. If tomorrow it doesn't get better, I give up hope. No, just accept it as it comes. This is called nirasa. Yeah, it means don't have that expectation. It must happen in a certain way. Because human beings say, I must make it before I am 40. If I don't make it or become successful yeah, before 40, I am a useless person. So he becomes sad yeah, when he can't make it. But maybe he will make it at 42 years of age. So work as hard as you can. Develop the hope, but don't put a an expiry date on it. Yeah, accept things as they come. And we are hoping to develop the liberating insight of anicca, dukkha, anatta. Because we know such is the nature of the world. Things will be subject to impermanence, change. It will be subject to suffering. It will be subject to not having a permanent character or uh, existence. Now, what do we do? We are still living with uncertainty, but we must take the steps to overcome it. 
we must not think that fine, everything is great. It's already over. It is not over. But, you know, we will still do the things that we enjoy. We will still come together as a group, but we must take all the necessary precautions. We must be wise, basically. We must be intelligent. And if people are not going to follow those precautions, don't mix with them. Yes, because they are not taking your safety and your security seriously. They think that, ah, don't worry, don't worry. People who don't worry like this, yeah, it doesn't mean they have no fear. They do not know how to deal with the fear. Some people deal with fear by saying, there's no problem. That is not wise. Right? So, we know how to manage our risks. We don't want to endanger others as well. So, we take all the necessary precautions. Now, i just like to come to the end. Yeah, it's almost the end. There is a happiness. There are two types of happiness. i just like to explain. There is the happiness of sensual enjoyment. That's what many of us hope for. We have been taught since young, you must work hard, you must make so much money, you must have a house, you must have property, then you will be happy. So we are promised this. You know, Achan Brahm once told the story. He said when he was in secondary school, his teachers and his family said, you must pass the O-levels, our SPM. When you pass your O-levels, you will be happy. So he worked hard and he passed O-levels. Then they said, eh, not finished yet, there's A-levels. Then he said, hold on. Okay, lah, right, A-levels. I will work hard for A-levels. So he studied and he got through his A-levels. And then his parents say, ah, now you must go university. <laughs> At this stage, he began to get wise. Ah, hold on, right? There's always something, he said, he realized, to run after. But he came to the conclusion that there is a happiness that we will experience without having sensual enjoyment. So we give up that sensual part and we have the enjoyment of renunciation. Okay, this renunciation is not shave your hair, wear orange robes. It is letting go the things that do not give us advantage, benefit. When you come here, are you enjoying <laughs> sensual pleasure? Okay, it's a very nice hall. It's air-conditioned. Yeah. But you could be doing other things, couldn't you? But still you come here, wear masks, <laughs> sit on the floor, some sit on the chair. There are more enjoyable things to do. But still you are happy to do this. It is the happiness of letting go. You let go other things so that you can be happy in a different way. This is the happiness of letting go. It doesn't cost much money. Other things cost a lot of money. But this doesn't cost a lot. It's traveling, yes. So, this kind of happiness is called Niramisa Sukha. We know what it is, but sometimes we don't put our finger on it. Sometimes we think, why am I happy? Eh? <laughs> and some people will ask, why are you happy? Eh? Did you strike lottery? Eh? No. I am happy because there is no greed anger and delusion. When there is no greed, anger and delusion, the mind is 
incredibly happy by itself. That is the nature of the mind to be happy. Why are we not happy? Because we disturb the original factory setting, the default setting of the mind. We go and do all kinds of funny, funny things and think, now I will be happy. Then we think, hey, how come I'm not happy? <laughs> because we are not following that nature. So therefore, we must understand two kinds of happiness. The happiness of going and getting so, so many things and the happiness of letting go. Letting go all those things. And when we are quiet and when we are peaceful, ah, the happiness will appear by itself. You don't have to call for it. It will appear. So, the wise words of uh, another very famous teacher who has passed away. Today, I share with you words of teachers who have passed away. Venerable Nyanaponika Thera, very famous uh, Western teacher who lived in Sri Lanka till he passed away. People used to ask him, is Buddhist practice easy? And his answer was, no, it's not easy. Is Buddhist practice worth it? And his answer is, yes, it's really worth it. Because the result of this is happiness. Great happiness. Deep happiness that comes with courage and it comes with hope. That's why yeah, it's so important. So I end with this aspiration. Let us aspire to practice the Buddha's teachings with greater courage, with greater hope. And again, my dear Dhamma brothers and sisters, Happy Buddha Day. Thank you.